welcome to season four, episode two of Kitty Cat Go Live, where we discuss various topics related to cat adventure, travel, training, and enrichment. I'm your host, Emily Hall, and tonight we're chatting about feline diseases. Perhaps not glamorous, but it's important for us to be aware of what's out there so we can prevent disease and keep our kitties healthy. If you're watching with us tonight or on the replay, be sure to say hello in the comments and tell us where you're watching from. Questions are encouraged along the way as well. Our special guests for the evening are Dr. Danielle Maybank and Dr. Dean Vixman. Dr. Maybank is a small animal veterinarian working in Denver, Colorado. She has dedicated her veterinary career to working exclusively with cats. Dr. Maybank is also a board member for the Every Cat Health Foundation. In addition, she is a member of the Ameri American Association of Feline Practitioners and is medical director of an all cat hospital in Colorado. She has a special interest in working with senior kitties, but enjoys helping cats of all ages. Dr. Vixman graduated from Colorado State University School of Veterinary Medicine in 1986. He subsequently did an internship at Angel Memorial Animal Hospital in Boston. He co-founded Evans East Animal Hospital and Denver Cat Hospital in Denver, Colorado, and practiced and managed them until 2022. He currently serves on the following boards, President-elect of the Every Cat Health Foundation, the Colorado State Board of Vet Veterinary Medicine, the Animal Assistance Foundation in Colorado, and the Gray Muzzle Organization. All right, let's bring them on. Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Good, how are you guys? We're good. Doing well, thanks for having us. Yeah, I'm so glad to have you here. Um, I Maybe thinking about diseases is not the most fun topic, but it's so important. And, um, you know, I know everyone watching and probably every cat owner is wants to make sure we give our cats the healthiest life possible. And so I'm excited to hear from you guys on how we can prevent disease, treat the common diseases and and all that comes with that. So thank you. Glad to be um, here. Yeah. Um, someone in the comments is asking if you can ask questions, and yes, you absolutely can. If you have questions along the way, um, just drop them in the comments, and I will be sure to ask um, our guests when when it comes up. All right, well, um, let's kick things off by you guys telling me a bit about your pets. Dr. Maybank, do you want to start? What kind of pets do you have? Yeah, so I have one kitty. Um, he's a 12 year old domestic long hair and I adopted him about three years ago now after my 17 year old kitty passed away. So um, he's the king of the house. So he's happy to be the only cat <laughs> and you might hear him meowing. So apologies. <laughs> hey, if he makes an appearance, even better. <laughs> How about you, Dr. Vixman? Who do you have at home? So, so I live in a very busy household. Um, I have six dogs and one very special kitty cat that gets along with all six of those dogs. Wow. So, you know, amazing. But she, she, nice. yeah, she's pretty special. And she's in here, so she may make an appearance. Awesome. Yeah. Cat appearances and dog appearances, too, are always welcome. Mm -hmm. <laughs> awesome. Um, well, you guys both serve on the board for the Every Cat Health Foundation. Can you tell us a bit about what that is and, and what that organization does? Sure, I think I'll take that. So most people don't realize this, but the Every Cat Health Foundation has actually been around for 60 years, been around a long time. And if it involves cat health, um, you can you can rest assured that that we're a part of it. Um, we are the only organization with only nonprofit that's solely dedicated to feline research, both nationally and internationally. Um, we're comp you know we're comprised of a scientific review committee, and we meet twice a year and um, are involved in in grants for for again critical feline research. That's awesome. Yeah. Um, I try to keep up with all the, the studies you guys do and your website is such a great resource for um, news in the cat health world. It's definitely the go-to place for information on feline health. Um, it's a great website and, and full of information. And um, again, really if it involves feline health, 
you can you can pretty much bet that uh, every cat health foundation has in the past present or future been a part of it we we are actively involved in in um every aspect of feline research today yeah that's awesome it's so good to know that there's an organization that's dedicated exclusively to to cat health and, and cat research i mean that's that's amazing no, you know, everything from feline heart disease, diabetes, infectious disease, um, genetics. Uh, listen, I mean, every aspect of feline medicine um, we, we've had a part of um, important research. I mean, FIP that we'll talk about coming up here in the future. We've been integral in terms of, of finding finding medications and and, and uh, treatments, hopefully, and uh, and understanding that disease um, in in depth. Uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which many of your um, your your listeners may know things about. We've been integral in in research there. Um, it's it's uh, on the website. You can see a lot of the grants that we do and where we're involved. Um, and again, some of the really cutting edge early research in feline medicine. Yeah, very cool. Well, you mentioned infectious diseases, and so let's kind of go that direction first. Um, so most of my audience is comprised of people who go outside with their cats on a harness and leash, and um, you know, one of the hazards of going outside is all of the different things that a cat can be exposed to. Um, and what are some of the, the more common infectious diseases that we should be aware of as we adventure and travel with our cats outdoors? Sure. So I'm happy to talk on that one. So it does depend a little bit on where you live. So naturally kind of the warmer, more humid environments are a little bit more of a breeding ground for um, some of our contagious diseases, although we definitely see it in some of the colder, drier climates as well. So some of the big ones would be external parasites. So we're, most of us are familiar with fleas, ticks. Those are the most common external parasites that we see. Um, technically speaking, intestinal parasites can also be picked up outside. So most of them are transmitted via fecal oral um, connection, which means the cat would have to ingest species of another animal, which technically if they're going outside and they're stepping in um, mud or puddles or dirt and then grooming themselves, it could be picked up that way. Um, so those are definitely things to be mindful of. Um, some of your other um, really concerning contagious cat diseases would be your viruses. So feline leukemia, FIV, both of those can be transmitted if a kitty is outside. Uh, that risk is lower naturally if they're on a harness because the owner is able to control and make sure they're not having direct cat to cat contact. However, technically something like feline leukemia can live outside of the body. But if that cat was to cross an area where another cat had been that was infected with feline leukemia, technically it could be picked up as well. Um, so those are your more common ones, but in addition, you can see fungal diseases, again, depending on the part of the U.S. that you live in. Um, distemper as well, though not common, that can be spread from cat to cat as well. I think yeah. GR too, Danielle, and Dr. Maybank, if you would agree. Yeah. Depending on the parts of the country that you're in, Giardia would be another one. And that's a, that's a stomach thing, right? Like intestinal or something, right? Typically GI. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So stomach intestines. Yeah. So what I'm hearing is uh, even if we're, you know, supervising our cats outside and they're on a harness and leash, they can still, they can still be at risk for picking up different diseases. And like you said, the parasites, that's why it's so important that we're using like flea and tick control. And, um, you know, a lot of those also uh, have dewormers and, and things like that in them. Um, and then also make sure we wipe our cat's paws down when we come inside and things like that. So that way they don't groom anything potentially hazardous when they come back inside. 
Yeah, those are all really great recommendations. Um, I think also just being mindful of where you're taking the cat. Like I said, you know, some areas, if there is a lot of other stray cats, for example, just to be super careful. But I would imagine most people aren't walking their cat on a harness, <laughs> you know, in the middle of some of those areas. But just to kind of have that in the back of your mind is important. Um, the other thing I would add to that, too, is keeping your kitties' vaccines up to date is also critical. Um, I mean, if they're outside, technically, I mean, if there's a rabid animal that they're exposed to, there could be some exposure to rabies, even though that risk is low. It's not zero. So rabies is, is an important one. Um, and then also our feline distemper combination vaccine, also called FVRCP, um, mm -hmm. does have distemper virus in it and um herpes virus in it as well. So other diseases that can be picked up from other kitties. You know, I think another important point, Dr. Maybank, is, is that even on indoor cats, um, when it comes to rabies, I think something we need to think about is, is that bats are not uncommon sometimes in people's houses. Mm -hmm. um, and bats are a source of rabies. And so even indoor cats really do. I, I, people, you know, we hear all the time, my cat's indoors, it's never going to get exposed to rabies. And believe it or not, it's untrue, um, especially, you know, apartment complexes and things like that. And when you think about it, cats are really interested in birds. Um, and so they see a sick bat on the ground, they're inclined to go investigate. So really important to uh, get your even get your cats vaccinated for rabies. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like you mentioned, even if your cats are indoor only and they don't go out at all, whether on a harness and leash or otherwise, it's still important to keep those vaccines up to date. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> um, another disease you mentioned was FIP. Is that one that could be picked up outdoors? Um, so FIV and feline leukemia, so FIV is a feline immunodeficiency virus. Um, it is commonly confused with FIP, but they're two completely different diseases. Um, FIP would not, it's a little bit not quite that cut and dry, but generally speaking, FIP would not be in the U.S. would not be picked up. Um, from cat to cat outside. Um, most of our FIP cases that we're seeing in the U.S. are from a virus that most cats have been exposed to and can just be an innocent virus in their body, where mm -hmm. in one individual cat, that virus might mutate to the point where that cat develops FIP. Um, so just to kind of make that distinction between FIV, which is a different type of cat disease. They all are so similar sounding. <laughs> <laughs> all of our acronyms. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so FIP, um, that one stands for feline infectious peritonitis. Am I saying that right? Peritonitis. Peritonitis. Okay. Yep. Um, so you mentioned that's something that most cats are exposed to and then some in some cats it just mutates and becomes something serious can you expand on that tell us a little bit more about fip i know most people hear that and either don't know what it is or it's a scary thing right because it's this disease that's sort of i don't know mysterious there's not there hasn't always been a cure for it and the one that's there as you know we'll talk about is not fda approved um, so I don't know, can you guys tell us about it? Yeah, so FIP historically and, and, and currently still without treatment is a fatal disease, um, unfortunately. And it is a disease that will typically affect young cats. So usually cats less than a year of age, but also kind of your one and two year old kitties. It can actually affect older cats as well, but most cats are quite young when they develop it. Um, and the virus that is infecting these kitties can live in the GI tract. And again, most of the time, it's just an innocent virus. In some cats, it can cause a little bit of diarrhea. But in that individual cat where the virus changes and becomes FIP, those cats can become quite sick. 
Um, so the tricky part, one of the many tricky parts actually about FIP is it doesn't present the same way often in every cat. Mm -hmm. um, there are some cats where there's two different types of FIP that we see. One is what we call a wet form and the other is called a dry form. The wet form, cats' bellies tend to fill up with fluid. So sometimes those can be a little bit easier to recognize and diagnose because we can actually sample that fluid and run tests on it. But it's the cats that present without the fluid and just vague signs of they're not growing, they're not eating well, kind of unexplained fevers. There can be a lot of different outward signs that we see, which makes it tricky sometimes to know which cats are FIP versus something else. Yeah, because some of those symptoms are kind of generic, you know, like, what could it be? <laughs> right, right. Yeah, that's hard. We don't have a perfect test for it. I mean, that, that, mm -hmm. that, that's the issue right now is that there's, we just can't draw blood and sit there and say your cat has FIP. Yeah. Um, it, it, it's complicated. It's kind of a, a whole combination of, of, you know, changes in blood test parameters, clinical signs. Um, there are tests that we can do to identify FIP, but it's not a simple, easy, just let's draw some blood and your cat has FIP. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's, that's so scary. I know, you know, when, when our cats are sick, we want answers, you know, so, so quickly, so that way we know what to do and, and how to treat it. And the fact that there's not uh, a quick and easy, like, oh yeah, this is what your cat has just makes it I don't know. Makes it scary. <laughs> is there, um, are there like certain factors that make a cat more likely for them to, if they're carrying that virus, are there certain factors that they might have that make it more likely for it to turn into FIP rather than just, you know, just a little bit of stomach upset or what, what you mentioned, Dr. Maybank? Yeah, so most of the cases, we're not exactly sure why in one cat they just have kind of the virus in more of an innocent form, and in another cat it turns into FIP. That piece isn't fully understood. Mm -hmm. um, it is thought, though, that cats that live in a more dense environment, so um, just meaning if they're around a large population of other cats, that potentially their risk might be higher. But again, there's just so much to it that it's really hard to say definitively which cats are at greater risk. Yeah. That makes it scary too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, so many unknowns with it. Um, right. What if, so if you suspect that a cat does have it, what can be done? I know you said it's typically fatal. Um, you know, are there treatments, are there things you can do that, you know, might extend the life or, or, you know, help? I'll, I'll take this one, Danielle. Sure. <laughs> so, you know, we're living in some interesting times, Emily, to be honest with you. So there are, you know, again, I, I'm going to have to come back to the Every Cat Health Foundation because it's our re research funded by us that has um, identified potential treatments for FIP. We're living in some pretty in some pretty exciting times, to be honest with you. Um, realize that I graduated a long time ago in 1986, and so for for 30 years here, you know, if you came in and your cat had FIP, we unfortunately have to tell you that there's nothing we can do, and that this is ultimately going to be a terminal disease for your cat, which is really very frustrating because again, it's often young cats. And, and as you and I, we discussed in the, before the show, there's really no human equivalent to this disease. So owners have a very hard time understanding it. But again, the good news is, is that recently there, there have been some medications that have um, been identified that can potentially treat this disease. These medications, unfortunately, in the United States are not FDA approved. They are approved in other countries and they're well researched in, other, in our country and other countries and they're effective and they work well. It's just difficult. To, it's not easy to, to get necessarily easy to get those medications through your veterinarian to help treat your cat. 
So there are some avenues that owners can can pursue, and and we discussed that, and that may be something you want to discuss, you know, with your with your viewers. But again, the exciting news is, is that there are potential treatments available for cats that have FIP, which we didn't even dream of, um, as you know, even even five years ago. Mm -hmm. So this is really exciting times for cats with FIP. Yeah, that is exciting to hear. Um, you know, things are moving forward, and what maybe used to be such a scary thing is becoming a little bit less scary every day. Um, and I know one resource out there, if someone has a cat with FIP and you're looking for um, some treatment, despite the fact that it's not FDA approved here in the US, if you reach out to FIP warriors, you can get some information on how to pr procure that treatment for your cat. You know, and as veterinarians, I think Dr. Maybank would agree with me that we're pretty comfortable in monitoring cats that are on, you know, if owners can acquire these medications and treat their cats with these medications as veterinarians, you know, we're happy to, to monitor and help owners through the process. Um, you know, once that, once the owners have, have done their due diligence and, and, and figured out how to acquire that medication, um, we're comfortable in, in, in assisting them in terms of monitoring and blood tests and things like that. But again, exciting times for cats in veterinary medicine. Yeah. Do you think um, it's not far on the horizon for the U.S. to have an FDA approved treatment here? I know we're working on it. There's several companies that are working on getting FDA approval for medications. Um, how far out is that? I don't know. Um, you know, things move slowly, unfortunately, when it comes to drug, you know, drug approvals in the United States. Um, but I do think that there's hope and that, yes, um, hopefully in the, in the future here, we'll have, we'll have uh, approved treatments for cats. Yeah. Well, that's good news. And that'll be something to celebrate when it happens. Agreed. It'll Most make life much easier way. for all of us. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, one of our viewers, Alex, has a question. She um, says that one of her cats is very extroverted and loves to meet people and dogs. And she's wondering if she should worry about any diseases being passed from um, to her cat from dogs if her cat touches noses with a friendly dog. Yeah, so this would be a situation, again, where the risk wouldn't be zero, but overall fairly low if we're talking about spread of disease specifically with the cat to dog interaction. Um, technically, I mean, fleas can jump fairly far, you know, so depending on the prevalence of fleas in that location, that would be something to think about. But definitely if we have the kitty on some sort of flea preventative, we can feel at least a little bit better about that. Um, but again, the risk is, is still going to be fairly low. If they're just kind of touching nose to nose and there's not a whole lot beyond that, it's pretty low risk. That's good to know. Are there, so that kind of makes me think of a question, are there diseases that can be passed from human to cat? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, technically, yes. Um, We've seen some a little bit more bizarre things, but sometimes skin mites can pass mm -hmm. from people to, to cats and dogs. Um, and that would include things like ringworm as well, um, mm -hmm. which is uh, a skin fungus that can be transmitted between people and cats and dogs and other species here too. Um, there's still a lot that's unknown about some of the emerging viruses in people, whether or not it can be spread to cats. But as far as we know right now, um, the answer to that would be no, um, that there's nothing that we know can be directly spread to the point that it makes the cat ill in terms of any of those upper respiratory diseases. I think you mentioned the big one that most people think about, and that's ringworm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a really contagious one too. I volunteer at a shelter here in um, my town, and one of the volunteers had ringworm, and spread from her to the cat to I guess one of the cats, and then to many of the cats at the shelter. It was it was a huge fiasco. That's a that's a hard one. <laughs> yeah. It is not fun, especially when it's spreading through the whole household, trying to treat everyone in the environment. And yeah, yeah. it's tricky. Yeah. Um, 
So Dr. Maybank, you mentioned FIV when you were specifying, you know, the FIV, FIP are two different diseases. So I want to talk a little bit about FIV and, um, well, F FELV, feline leukemia, you mentioned that one as well. They are sometimes mixed up. Um, and a lot of times people hear, hear FIV and think that it's super contagious the way that FELV is. Um, can you give us some clarification on the difference between those two diseases? Sure, sure. So both of them are, again, contagious cat diseases, so only spread between cats from cat to cat contact. Feline leukemia can be spread a little bit more casually. So cats that are sharing food dishes, water dishes, mutually grooming each other, it can be spread that way. Um, a low chance, like I'd mentioned before, of it being spread in the environment, but that virus only lives for a few hours outside of the body. So the risk with that is going to be fairly low. Um, when it comes to FIV, that one is harder to transmit. So usually we're looking looking at deep bite wounds, so two cats that are fighting with each other to the point of drawing blood, um, sexual contact, contact, so if we have a kitty that's intact, not spayed or neutered, and is exposed to another cat, it can be transmitted that way as well. Um, they've actually done studies on two, uh, or a, an FIV positive cat in a household with a, a non FIV positive cat or a cat without FIV, and found that they can coexist and that the risk, again, is, is pretty, pretty low unless they're fighting to the point of drawing blood, which hopefully that wouldn't be the case, especially if it was two kitties living in the same household. Yeah. Yeah. I actually have a cat that's FIV positive and um, she's, she's almost 12 and um, she was a stray that my husband and I rescued. And uh, when I took her to the vet and got her tested, um, the vet that I took her to think was a little outdated in his information. He told me, you know, I should put her down that she wasn't going to be able to have a good quality of life. And thankfully I didn't listen. I, I came home and did a bunch of research online and discovered, you know, that she could have a good life and could even be with my other cats. As long as like you said, Dr. Maybank, they don't fight. Unfortunately, she is a biter. So <laughs> she, uh, she has her own area of the house that she lives in, but she's very healthy. And, um, you know, I think people hear FIV and think like HIV, you know, like the human equivalent and AIDS. And, you know, that's such a scary word and it doesn't have to, to mean that, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And like you mentioned, they can live completely normal lives. And just being mindful that kitties with FIV are at a greater risk of developing infections. So, you know, just always monitoring them very closely. Um, I usually also recommend lab work done once a year just to kind of stay on top of things and try and catch any changes early. But um, we see a lot of FIV positive cats that are doing great. Yeah. And like FIP, or I guess not exactly because FIP has some um, drugs in trials and, and like you said, working towards FDA approval, but is there, there's not a cure for FIV, right? There's not, no. And there's also not an effective vaccine either for FIV. Yeah. But we do have an effective vaccine for FELV. Mm -hmm. Yes. And that's, that's, that's one of the standard ones, right? Um. Yes and no. So um, it is considered a lifestyle vaccine in adult kitties, meaning that if they have exposure, so going cats that go outside where they may come into contact with other cats, it is considered kind of core for those kitties. Mm -hmm. um, the American, apologies, my earbuds are falling out. Um, the AAFP recommendations is also to vaccinate kittens as well with the thought that they have baby immune systems. If they ever snuck outside, it's better that they're protected than not. Um, so we use the feline leukemia in a lot of kittens as well. And we need to remember that if we have a, a cat from a single cat household and it's a strictly indoor cat, you, you know, getting it vaccinated as a kitten is important. But if it's strictly indoors and doesn't go outdoors and it's a cat to cat contact disease and it's an only cat, then that's why it's a lifestyle vaccine. That cat may not need to be revaccinated um, 
for it versus yeah. a cap that goes indoor and indoor outdoor cap. That makes sense. Is there um, is there a cure for feline leukemia? No, unfortunately, there's not a cure for that. Yeah. Know, darn. Maybe one day. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, well, with all this research and research on your plates. To, to <laughs> what did you say, Dr. Vixen? I'm sorry. I said with all this current research in antivirals and humans and you know and kitties, hopefully someday. Yeah, that's that's what I was gonna say. With all the research you guys do, you've got a, a lot of opportunity <laughs> to to do so much research, and and I know you guys do, and. So that gives us all hope that, like you said, one day there will be cures for these diseases. And it's good to know at least there's um, some vaccines that help prevent some of these things like the feline leukemia. For sure. Um, so another one, another disease you guys mentioned was distemper. And that's the same as panleukopenia, right? Is that, am I saying that one right? It is. Yeah. So same as panleukopenia. Sometimes people will also call it feline parvo, um, but they're all from the same virus. And that's another one that has a vaccine, right? You mentioned that it one. That's does. the standard one. Yeah. Correct. Yeah. So that's in kind of your standard core vaccine that we recommend on a regular basis for kitties, whether they're indoor or outdoor. Yeah, so this is um, a disease that I have read a lot about because one of my cats has cerebellar hypoplasia, the neurological disorder, and that can a lot of times be caused by the mother cat having distemper, panleukopenia, you know, when she's pregnant. And um, so when I adopted my wobbly cat, I did a lot of research on on um, this disease, but um, I'd love to hear from you guys, What what is it? Um, is there any research now on, on, you know, curing it or I don't know, what, what can you guys tell us about this one? <laughs> sure. Um, so, uh, cerebellar hypoplasia basically has to do with the brain not forming properly. So specifically the part of the brain, which is the cerebellum, one of the big responsibilities is balance and, you know, allowing the cat to know where they're walking in space, essentially. Yeah. So cats that have an underdeveloped um, part of their brain can be kind of wobbly, hence the name wobbly disease or wobbly syndrome, um, where they can um, kind of have this funny, cute little gait where, um, you know, they sometimes will have a, a wider gait or they kind of sway a little bit when they're walking back and forth. Um, the good news, though, is those cats can have a normal life as well. Otherwise, they're typically very normal kitties. Um, they just need a little bit more help. As you know, Emily, it's, if you have a cat with that of, you know, getting used to this is your litter box, help potentially getting in and out of it, kind of modifying some things in your home just so that they can move around a little bit easier. Um, and as far as research goes, this is a disease that is is pretty well understood at this point. Um, and it's not a situation where we could create like a vaccine against that specifically. Um, and again, just knowing it is due to a virus that mama cat can get while she's pregnant, the biggest thing is just to make sure that cats are vaccinated, fully vaccinated prior to becoming pregnant um, in hopes that we can avoid something like that. Yeah. So is, sorry, go ahead. Well, I think it's also important to point out that you don't want to vaccinate your pregnant cat. Mm, with not that. while pregnant. Yeah. Yes. But while they are pregnant, because that can also cause the, the it's a modified live back uh, virus. And so if you vaccinate a, a pregnant cat um, with the distemper vaccine, it can lead to the same problems. Yeah. Yeah. So is, is the distemper virus one that can pretty easily be picked up? So it can. I did actually have um, 
a owner who had several indoor only kitties that were not up to date on vaccines. And she was also feeding um, a colony of outdoor stray cats. And she actually, what we suspect happened is she brought it in either on her shoes or her clothing and all of her cats got sick with panleukopenia. Um, mm. So while that is not something that happens commonly, I always use that as a good example of, you know, who would think of something like that? You know, those cats had no contact with any of the outdoor kitties, but because it can live in the environment, it can be passed to indoor kitties. Yeah. Wow. That, that is a really great example of how indoor cats should be vaccinated regardless. Um, is there a treatment for it? So the woman whose cats got it, did they all recover? Yeah, so for, fortunately, all of her cats did recover. Um, it's a pretty long recovery period, and not every cat does make it. Um, a lot of these cats end up with really high fevers, and they're not eating. And so it can be really tricky to get them over that to the point where they're eating and feeling better again. Um, but it's usually a pretty long road to get there. Well, at least, um, at least there is some treatment for it. That's good. It's yeah, supportive treat care. yeah, exactly. What was that? I'm sorry. It's supportive care. So if they get exposed, you, we just have to let their body fight off the fight off the uh, virus and support them through it. Um, that having been said, especially kittens just don't, don't have a lot of reserve capacity, and so they're they're much more likely to to be ill and and maybe not survive if they get it. Yeah. Yeah. But the good news is we can vaccinate. And if mom's vaccinated, then mom passes those antibodies on to her kittens. And then mm -hmm. if we get the kittens vaccinated under the right vaccine schedule, it's really not a problem. So, you know, I think that when we look at, at, at uh, distemper, it's really more of an educational issue than it is a research issue. It's getting the word out about vaccines and, and having owners understand the vaccine schedule and just getting kitties vaccinated because it's such an effective vaccine. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. It's a good, a good uh, reminder. Yep. <laughs> Vaccinate your cats. <laughs> it's important. Yeah. Um, I want to steer a little bit away from the infectious diseases and talk about some of the other um, diseases like kidney disease. I know that is such a common disease, especially for cats as they age. Um, it seems like, you know, I don't know, chronic kidney disease. I just hear about all the time, you know, on social media and older cats. And in fact, um, growing up, two of my cats when I was a kid died from, from CKD. And, um, I would love to get your, um, thoughts and I don't know why, why do you think it's so common? How can we prevent it? Um, you know, all of that. Sure. Do you want me to take that one? I'll let you take that one. Okay. Um, so yeah, so everything you said as far as the prevalence of kidney disease is accurate. I mean, unfortunately, we see so many cats that have kidney disease. Um, we always like to differentiate between what we call kind of acute kidney disease, which it's something that typically happens sort of suddenly or almost like an insult to the kidney. So that can be things like uh, cat ingesting antifreeze or um, lily flowers. So we have to be super cautious with that. Um, if they have access to lily flowers and they eat it, it can actually cause kidney failure. Um, those would be again in kind of the acute sudden category. Um, a lot of what we're seeing though is the chronic kidney disease, which unfortunately is another disease that the cause of it is not entirely understood, kind of the mechanism of, of how it happens, we don't fully understand. There's a bunch of different kind of theories and thoughts out there of, you know, is this related to chronic inflammation in the body um, or, you know, loss of blood to the kidney at different points in a cat's life. So there's just a lot of pieces to it. Um, there are also some uh, genetic diseases that can cause it as well. 
um, where they can actually get depo deposits of um, fat on the kidney, where that can actually cause kidney damage as well. But most of what we're seeing is our older kitties that have what we call chronic kidney disease, um, which and like I said, unfortunately, is very common. Um, so the biggest thing is that there is a lot of research being done, though, on how can we manage these cats? How can we catch it in the earlier stages so we can hopefully slow down the progression? Um, so that's a big area uh, of focus right now. And the Every Cat Health Foundation, by the way, is very involved in, in a lot of this research. Um, we've got a lot of out there um, that are strictly uh, dedicated towards um, chronic kidney disease in kitties and, and diagnosing and catching it early and treating and all of that. So yeah. hopefully more, more in the future. Yeah, I'll have to have you guys on again. Like, I wonder what, I wonder how this episode would go in a year from now, you know? <laughs> a year from now, what what will you guys have to say? <laughs> Things are always changing, evolving. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, that kind of brings me to my next question, actually. What's new and what's coming for the Every Cat Health, Health Foundation? What What do you guys have going on right now? We have actually are, are pretty active, got a lot of things going on right now that, that, that your li listeners would, may be interested in. Um, short term, we uh, have a symposium coming up August 13th and 14th. And that's uh, it's, it's uh, in conjunction with North Carolina State University. And that's on feline pain. Um, and uh, viewers can go to our website to find out more information. But there's there's open slots both virtually and in person to attend. Um, we have another symposium coming up in the end of June. That's in conjunction with Cat F International Cat Fancy Association. And I believe that's going to be on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, which is a heart disease in cats that we've uh, invested a lot in terms of research dollars. Um, ex other exciting things I think that you're going to see out of the out of the Every Cat Health Foundation, we're starting to form some strategic partnerships. And so right now we're involved with uh, Morris Animal Foundation and the Denver Dumb Friends League. And we're doing a research study um, in shelter medicine, which is really exciting to, to see how, um, hopefully how kitty cats do in, in dens within, a, within the shelter. Um, so that's exciting to see groups working together like this to try to solve problems in cats. Um, lots of things that we're doing. And obviously, the, if you go to the Every Cat uh, Health Foundation, the every, everycat.org, that's where a lot of the things that we're doing in the future um, owners can find out about. Yeah. So here I'm going to put that website up on the screen so people can see everycat.org is where you can check out all the latest research and events happening with the Every Cat Health Foundation. Do you guys have like um, an email list that people could sign up for to stay up to date on what you guys are doing? We definitely do. Um, and um, we have monthly webinars that owners can attend. Um, and there are various levels, some for veterinarians, some for um, just the general public. Um, the ones for veterinarians are, uh, I believe, race approved so that they can get continuing education credits, which is great for them. Um, so that's once a month, fascinating topics that we get guest speakers in um, to talk about. Uh, again, we have a, a, a month, we have a, we do have an email newsletter that, that keeps people up to date on everything that we're doing. And they can sign up, I believe, at the website. Yeah. Awesome. And I, I would also recommend checking out the Facebook page, too, because um, there are a lot of posts on uh, coming up events or, um, again, the continuing education, all of that. Um, it's very up to date. Usually there are posts, you know, at least a couple times a week. So that's also a really good resource. Awesome. And that's just the Every Cat Health Foundation Facebook page? Correct. Awesome. Well, um, I will give viewers a final chance to drop any questions about diseases, illnesses, the Every Cat Health Foundation, whatever you guys may have. Here's your last chance to ask your questions. Um, 
But I just want to thank you guys for being here tonight, sharing your time and your expertise. I have learned a lot and I am feeling hopeful for the future of cat health. <laughs> Yes. Thanks so much for having us on and giving us this opportunity. And, you know, like I said before, I'm always happy to talk about cats. So <laughs> same here and lots of exciting stuff in the future. So stay posted. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, for those watching, um, again, be sure to check out the Every Cat Health Foundation website at everycat.org and um, sign up for their email list, check out their Facebook page if you are wanting to stay up to date on all the things that they have going on. Um, and then, um, oh, we have a final question actually from a viewer. Robin is wondering if you have any thoughts on what is causing so many cats to have IBD? I so wish that I could give you a definitive answer to that. Um, IBD and intestinal disease in cats is, is very much an area that is, there's a lot of current research on it. Um, so that's a positive thing is hopefully in five years from now, I, we can give you a definitive answer as to why so many cats have IBD. Um, but it is incredibly common. And so one of the things I always like to tell owners is not to ignore vomiting. It's one really big thing. So there's kind of this myth out there that cats vomit, it's what they do. But often it's because we have so many kitties that have IBD. So if you do notice that your kitty is vomiting, to reach out to your vet and, and have them checked out. Yeah, so it is very common. I have two cats that have recently been diagnosed with it in the past, I don't know, five or six months. And uh, I'm like, golly, I mean, I have seven cats, so I get, you know, the chances are high that somebody's going to have <laughs> they some. They are, unfortunately. <laughs> Man, two out of seven. <laughs> Dr. Maybank, do we have a lot of research going on through the Every Cat Health Foundation on IBD? There is, yeah. So small intestinal disease in general. Um, and I always kind of say that specifically because IBD and small cell lymphoma are, are very closely connected to each other. So there is also a lot of ongoing research of what's happening in these cats with IBD in their younger years. Are they actually developing lymphoma? So that's another area that's being looked at as well. Yeah. And so... When I first took one of my cats to the vet when, you know, he was not eating very well, he was throwing up a lot and they diagnosed him with IBD. They mentioned lymphoma like you were just talking about. And they said they're very similar and even treated very similarly. Is that right? Yeah. It's correct. Yeah. And, you know, we often find, too, that, you know, now some of the newer research is calling it almost like a spectrum where we have some cats where it's it's IBD, but could also be small cell lymphoma where we do treat them in a very similar fashion. Um, so the good news is that even if it's small cell lymphoma, it can be very manageable. Um, I have some cats who were diagnosed four or five years ago, and, and they're still doing pretty well. So that's, if you can call it the silver lining, that's what I would say is there are some good treatment options. Yeah, that's good. That is good. And to know also that there's research going on about it too. Mm -hmm. It definitely is. Lots of active research in that area. Yeah. Well, awesome. Well, um, Thank you again, guys. This is um, really great. And thank you for those watching, for um, bringing your questions and spending your evening with us. Uh, be sure to mark your calendars for the next episode of Kitty Cat Go Live, which will be Wednesday, April 10th at 8 p.m. My guest will be Kate Benjamin from House Panther. She'll be um, talking about catification. You might know her because she co-authored two books with Jackson Galaxy. Um, the Catify to Satisfy and Catification. So um, come check that out. I'm sure she'll have some really great tips on how we can catify our homes and give our cats, uh, you know, an enriching environment. Uh, but that's it for tonight. Be sure to hit that subscribe button if you're watching on YouTube and the follow button if you're watching on Facebook so you don't miss future episodes and happenings here at Kitty Cat Go. Uh, thanks again to our guests, Dr. Maybank and Dr. Vixman. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good night, everybody. Bye. <laughs> Bye.